I have been speaking to some of the leading thinkers of Brexit, politicians, economists, academics and lawyers, and asking them to look back on the campaign, but also about what our future holds as an independent nation. We are now in charge of our own destiny. So democracy has won, that you can change your government and the government can change your laws. That was always the biggest benefit of Brexit. It's then up to governments how they use it. I think it's great that we are now an independent country. I want us to use our freedoms rather more than we have so far. I think people have been a bit nervous and haven't understood uh, the joys of freedom. Uh, but nonetheless, we, we've had some good wins uh, since we left the European Union. Regaining sovereignty, regaining independence, regaining the power that the vote gives you to hire and fire those that directly affect your lives, all of that was absolutely the right thing to do. Of that, I've got no question. Uh, of that, I just don't see there's a debate. They knew that they were voting to get Britain out of the European Union. It was a very straightforward binary choice. Should Britain remain a member of the European Union or should it leave? And they, they made their decision. We just need to, to grab it and, and, and actually feel proud of what's been achieved and feel proud of our country. What Brexit is about is nothing more than Britain being able to control its own affairs. I think it's an incredible achievement and I think it says a lot about the resilience and passion the British people have for democracy. I'm still really optimistic that we can make a massive, great, tremendous success of it. But, like anything in life, if you're going to do a job, do it properly. After the vote we had all these debates about what sort of Brexit did we want? Well, it was quite straightforward. We wanted a Brexit which took us out of the European Union. The referendum result was without doubt very clear. The biggest democratic uh, vote in the history of democracy in this country. More people voted in the referendum than any other process. 17.4 million people voted to leave the European Union. That means the United Kingdom making laws and policies and regulations with only British national interest in mind. And we haven't got anywhere near that. People of Northern Ireland have no self-determination on matters of uh, economic sovereignty because they're being legislated for by a foreign power. I mean, that's the most extraordinary, unprecedented arrangement in modern times. And it's essentially in breach of international law. The biggest opportunity from leaving the European Union is that we should welcome free trade with the rest of the world on the basis that free trade benefits consumers. We are a very strong service sector exporter. We've gone to new records in service sector exports. And when we negotiate a trade deal, unlike the European Union, we give a lot of prominence to services. Osborne and, and Cameron, now this is the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the Exchequer, it's not Joe Bloggs, actually told the country that if they voted Brexit, not if they had Brexit, they just voted Brexit. We were going to have an emergency budget, unemployment was going to go through the roof, uh, the economy was going to crash. If they dared to vote for Brexit, well, none of these things actually happened. I can't sit here and pretend that the next few years are going to be easy because they're not. But the idea, ultimately, that no free people ever willingly give up the right to govern themselves, that's still is absolutely crystal clear in my mind. The fight is not over. The campaign is not over. So what was Brexit all about in reality? Well, let's hear the thoughts of some of the people I've been speaking to. It's all about sovereignty. It's all about running our own affairs. And we don't want to have our affairs run anymore by someone from another country. We want to run our own affairs, thank you very much. So it was a very simple choice. I think what people need to feel is that whatever we do, we are genuinely putting the interests of our own people first and putting the interests of Brexit voters first. This was a massive democratic mandate, the biggest election ever fought in the history of these islands. But if you look at more specific things, well, we got the vaccine earlier than anybody else, and that was because we didn't sign up to the slow, cumbersome, European way of doing things. Still on COVID, we've saved £191 billion by not being part of the EU's COVID 
recovery scheme. So that's really important. I mean, that is a huge amount of money, even in terms of our relatively bloated deficit, that we wouldn't have had control over how it was spent. So two major things before you get on to the financial services reform, that's before you get on to the free trade deals, the signing up to the Pacific trade deal, which takes us into the biggest growth market in the world. The problem with European law is you're only allowed to do something if it's specified in law. And so all these businesses have to follow a recipe or, or an agenda, which is actually laid out for them in law. Whereas in common law, you can do anything you like unless the law expressly says this is wicked or criminal or, or against the law. And we're shifting from the code system, which I think has been very anti-innovation, very anti-competition, to a common law system. And I hope it means we get closer to the US then in terms of digital success. Britons decided that they wanted to take back control. You remember that slogan, take back control. What do you define as taking back control? Taking back control is controlling our laws, our borders, um, everything we do about this country should be governed from within this country. That's your starting point. It was um, the decision to relocate political power back in the country. What you do with it afterwards is something that you thereafter decide. That's what democracy is for. We must make the most of Brexit. And as I say, that means becoming competitive. That means really taking control. Uh, of our borders. Uh, that, that means um, taking total control of our own laws and not being subject to any other court. Bits of it have been a success. Uh, we're out of the EU treaties. Um, the UK's got its uh, sovereignty back to a large degree. We got a result, but that result now needs to be carried through. There's so much more to be gained and we can do it just like we won the referendum. We can now win the battle. We've all had our fight and that fight has been worth it, even though it was a disappointing deal, just to get it over the line against that fierce muscle of Remain and peacocking internationalists who think more of global applause than national applause. That is to be celebrated. People voted to take back control of our borders, to make Britain great again. Brexit is that opportunity and we've got to go for it. Actually, I think it could be a phenomenal opportunity for renewal and to give effect to what we all want, which is a nimble, independent trading nation. But if we were to go back on those fundamental questions of membership of the single market in the customs union, that wouldn't be Brexit, and that would be a complete betrayal of what people voted for in 2016. What um, we've ended up having in our discussion in recent years is an underlying assumption in some quarters that Brexit itself is political. It's not really. There is a political choice as to whether to do it, then executing on it and doing it properly, which it seems to me is the only way of executing on that choice, is apolitical, funnily enough. I was very surprised by the reaction of many members of parliament who had no interest in honouring the referendum, even the ones who said Brexit means Brexit, that they actively went out of their way to try and stop us benefiting from Brexit in any way. What we've achieved over the last seven years has been hard fought and hard won. And we now have to make sure that we get the benefits of that and don't slide back into the orbit of Brussels. I'm asking lots of Brexiteers, do you regret it? I talk about it on my show. I've just been around a variety of constituencies at events. No one is telling me that who voted Brexit. They believe in it as a principle, as a great opportunity. I think in terms of Britain's standing in the world, we are definitely standing taller. I think the AUKUS deal, I think leadership over Ukraine, whether you agree with the position or not, show we are standing taller free of an EU foreign policy. Whenever there is a bad economic figure, then, oh, that is the fault of Brexit. But you never are told that a good economic figure, and we've had quite a few of those as well, is a result of Brexit. Why isn't it that low unemployment is the result of Brexit if they thought high unemployment was going to be the result of Brexit? Why is it that Britain not going into a recession, uh, is, why isn't that the result of Brexit? Just as Germany being in recession uh, obviously is an EU country that didn't do very well. Can Brexit really deliver the brighter future that Brexit is hoped for?
Yes, of course they can. Uh, and they've got to learn from all the countries that are highly successful, like Singapore, Taiwan, uh, Korea, amazing, Malaysia, all very different, uh, but uh, focusing in on, uh, for instance, technology, science, uh, mathematics, physics, the hard sciences. What should post-Brexit Britain look like to you? Well, what it should end up, the best place in the world to do business. And we should start yesterday. Next, we have a look at immigration, a topic of great concern to millions of people. Why did we win the referendum? We won it because the turnout was 10% higher than anyone thought it would be. And why was that? One overriding question. And that was the population explosion that had happened in Britain between 1997 and 2016, when the referendum took place. On that, we fail people dismally. Net migration is now two and a half to three times higher than it was before Brexit. And that's the legal bit. On the illegal bit, what I saw in 2015 was the EU putting in place its refugee policy, which meant anybody that crossed the Med and set foot on EU soil was allowed to stay. We must take control of our borders. We're seeing illegal immigration going through the roof, and we're seeing lawful immigration at record levels that no one ever envisaged. 2022, 1.2 million people coming here. That's not what people voted for. Take this aggressive mass immigration the Conservatives are now pu uh, pursuing against the spirit of Brexit. They will be punished for that at the ballot box more than they have ever done in my lifetime. The reality is people haven't seen any real wage growth for over 15 years. And that is because of unlimited, cheap, low-skilled immigration. The main Remainer gripe is about ex uh, passport queues and the ability to work in Europe which is a, something that neither they nor their children nor even probably their grandchildren have ever taken um, advantage of while we were members. But suddenly when we left, this is the big opportunity that somehow has been taken from them. And when you look at it, you go, well, how come all of the immigration was coming the other way? To many people, Brexit wasn't just about the economy, it was about sovereignty and who actually governs the United Kingdom. I remember well as a government minister uh, realising how we'd lost control of our ability to make our own decisions and our own laws. However good you were at playing the political game in Brussels, if France and Germany and the Commission had decided on something, it was extremely difficult to get anything different. Whichever way you look at it, it is an abnormal state of affairs. Uh, most citizens of a country want that country to be independent. Uh, there was a really a, almost a, a cultish uh, approach to the European Union. It was an article of faith that you wanted to be governed by somebody else. We've completely reversed the status quo. That was always the biggest battle. It wasn't that people loved the European Union. In fact, the truth is very, very few did. But reversing status quo in anything in a democratic society is incredibly hard. We've done it and we've succeeded with that. Certainly with foreign policy, for example, as well, making decisions by ourselves, what suits our country, not being dragged into uh, wars that we're not keen on, or an EU army, I mean, we're out of that. At the time that Theresa May was trying as hard as she could to just align with the EU, was also a time when we could have done a trade deal with the US, and the US was very interested in doing that, but they got timed out by the change in the uh, US administration. Don't give up. Don't just shrug and say, well, it's all over, you know, and we'll rejoin one day. Don't give up. Insist on having the thing that you voted for. If and when we get a government that actually cares about the United Kingdom, cares about the vote that we gave, the mandate we gave the government to get us out of the EU and to create an independent sovereign state, if we ever get a government that cares about that, they do have the right to terminate the TCA. And that... And that is its only redeeming feature. 
just keep going and do not be brainwashed by all this doom and gloom because the rejoiners are lying and they've told so many lies about what Brexit is to be blamed for. Do not trust them. They're the ones that try to sabotage a democratic vote. The British people know best. Stick with your instinct and stick with Brexit. We're going to now take a short look at the cost of living crisis, a topic that has dominated a lot of people's thinking over the past year. We are suffering from an inflationary problem. It seems to be getting worse rather than better. It seems to be more deep-seated than the Bank of England forecast. Now, one of the ways to deal with that is by increasing interest rates. But that's painful. That hits everybody. Um, that, that makes mortgage holders less well off. What you can do to make that easier is reduce regulation so the cost of goods comes down, so your economy is more competitive and prices fall. And that ameliorates the interest rate rise and makes people better off, which you couldn't do in the European Union. They told us that house prices have crashed and actually house prices carried on going up so that they're really rather expensive for people, but it was the opposite of what, what they were forecasting. Uh, and they've been forecasting a deep recession. Well, we, we didn't get a deep recession like other countries. The EU was very strange about imported food. They don't mind you using an iPhone even though they had Siemens and Ericsson and other um, phone producers in Europe. They were quite happy for people to import phones from China. But if you import lamb from New Zealand or beef from Australia, suddenly that's a problem, which is slightly insane. The chlorinated chicken thing is actually a consumer protection and has nothing to do with animal welfare. And the mega sh chicken sheds that you will find in the US are exactly the same as the mega chicken sheds you will find in the UK. Both countries have them. The chlorine wash that must be applied by US law to all chicken is to stop a thing called Campylobacter and Salmonella. They're two diseases that are very common in chicken. And it is water with chlorine added. You will be familiar with this product because we drink it in the UK. All of the water that comes out of our tap has chlorine added to it. Um, and it can have, under EU law, quite a lot of chlorine added to it. The limit is quite high. Let's take a look at how Brexit Britain has defied the doom mongers. Our economy is performing far better than they said it would. Above all, of course, we've spared ourselves an awful lot of money that we would have had to pay for them for their latest budgets. And we've ducked the coming big liabilities because, of course, now the EU is borrowing billions upon billions of money in its own name. And all that has to be backed by the member states. Nobody has talked about the massive problems that are going on within the European Union. Our economy may, may, may be in difficulty right now. The EU is in, and the Eurozone is in, recession. There are massive conflicts within the EU between North and South and East and West. Looking at the UK economy itself, we can run it a lot better without the shackles of Brussels. So the whole host of regulations and rules that we can get rid of, um, there are lots of things that we can do differently, for example, on state aid policy. Time out if you like what you're hearing and you also believe that the battle for Brexit is not yet over, then you can contribute to the cause. The links are below this video, cibuk.org, factsforeu.org. Please click and please donate. Thank you. The Remainers argue that it's been a negative, it's, 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 it's been a disaster at every level. It hasn't. It's not that it's been a disaster. It's that we haven't taken the opportunities and that's really the problem. We should put the foot flat on the accelerator of growth, of believing in Britain and becoming a great global nation again. But that means you've got to cut taxes, you've got to cut wasteful government spending, things that we can do now that we are free and sovereign. We make a lot of things that the rest of the world likes to buy. We don't do um, consumer goods. So a lot of people don't see us as a trading nation when in fact we make a lot of cars here. Some of them may be owned by the company, may be owned by a Japanese company, or it may be owned by an Indian company, but it's still made here. Even the Germans are still making cars here. We've got a chance to become a truly global Britain, to do big, bold trade deals with the rest of the world, and sometimes just to lower trade barriers unilaterally. We don't need to wait for trade deals to do that.
Now, when it comes to agriculture and our fisheries, Brexit provides many opportunities waiting to be grasped. There are a lot of things that we could actually do to give uh, our own fishing communities um, so much more opportunity than they've had. I mean, it's just it's that really that and Northern Ireland are the two areas that I just feel so almost upset about that are that, that we abandoned the fishermen. You know, we abandoned all those people who really thought that their their time had come once we left. It was crazy for them to give such access to the European fishing fleet. They should have been much, much tougher on that. And I hope that they are when that comes up for review, because fish used to be the, the main um, diet of, of the British. You know, the, the so-called national dish was fish and chips. Um, and it got sort of swapped out somewhere along the line to being chicken. Um, but uh, I think that uh, the fishing industry was great for all of those coastal communities. In many other sectors like agriculture, we can get away from the restrictions of the common agricultural policy. So we can run the UK economy better. It does intrigue me how misunderstood UK agriculture is. It's very good, but it cannot supply the population of the UK and it hasn't supplied the population of the UK for about 150 years. Boris said repeatedly in the Commons that come 2026 we'll get complete control back of our waters and we'll be able to dictate the total allowable catches to the, to, to the EU. That's not the case. The problem with the EU is you pay to be a member which basically means you, your companies don't have to pay for each consignment that comes through because the government is paying but included in that payment is the agreement to restrict imports from other countries uh, in accordance with the EU's tariff code, which for a lot of food is incredibly high. Perhaps more has been written on international trade after Brexit than any other topic. Will our guests unravel this next? The EU's approach is to protect producers, whereas actually an economy works better if you do things to the advantage of consumers. Most people when talking about trade focus on what you can export. What we should think about is how much can you import more cheaply that allows individuals, consumers, to improve their standard of living. The European Union uh, is looking increasingly sclerotic. Uh, it's top-heavy in terms of regulation. It's becoming increasingly uncompetitive and is accounting for a much smaller proportion of world trade. Whereas, of course, the UK now uh, is becoming a member of the CPTPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a, a, a combination of some of the most dynamic economies in the world. What we need to do is discover our traditional roots as a country, which is as a trading country, small and medium-sized enterprises going forth, being nimble, um, being aggressive in their, in their trading strategies, you know, and I use the word aggressive in a positive sense. Under the TPP, we will be able to grow our services much more quickly as a result, whereas the EU deals, on behalf of all of us, always concentrated on goods and didn't really take care of uh, the fast-growing and, and very successful UK service sector. We have now got two completely new trade deals, which the EU didn't have. We have rolled over about 70 trade deals that the EU had done before. We've improved on the Japanese deal. We've improved on the, the Singapore deal. They are presently negotiating an improved deal with Switzerland. Um, they are negotiating improved deals all over the place. None of them seem to think that we should obey their laws just because we got a trade deal with them. And yet the EU believes it's central to any relationship uh, with us uh, that we have to obey their laws. And indeed, they've done that with Norway. They've done that with Switzerland. Um, they want their law to be supreme. Those trade agreements have to be negotiated by this government on our terms. If not, then we come under the international trade agreement and we trade with any nation under those terms. Why should we spend all our mental energy on the EU when there is a larger, faster growing world economy outside the EU. So there may in future be tweaks that we will want to do, but I wouldn't make that the focus of policy. 
over time, the costs of benefit of Brexit, I think, will diminish and the benefits will increase as we take advantage of our newfound freedoms to do better trade deals with the rest of the world and also to run our own economy better than we do when we're told what to do by Brussels. From an import point of view, um, trade is importing goods that can be made elsewhere more cheaply than you can make them yourself is always a great benefit to any country. We're living in an era of international turmoil. So what is Britain's situation when it comes to defence in a post-Brexit world? Let's talk about uh, common defence policy. I mean, we were told that there was no way that the EU were planning to forge its own army. I think we have to recognise that the guarantor of uh, peace in, in Europe since the last war ha has been NATO. NATO is hugely important to this country and, in fact, to every European state, including European states outside the European Union. And the problem that we've got is that certain EU member states are setting up PESCO a a as a rival uh, to NATO. They say that they're not. They say that it's, it's an adjunct to NATO, but, but that is not the case. There have been a number of EU-led military interventions, both naval and army. Uh, and they want to build up their capability to do that. They're also, of course, very keen to have common weapons procurement, uh, which may make some commercial sense, but it also is a move designed to integrate the forces so that they are completely interdependent and then only operate together. The European Defence Fund is m a fund developed by the EU for research into military capability with the aim of EU military interoperability so that all EU member state armies can operate as if they're one army using the same t technology, using the same armaments, the same systems, so that they can all operate ostensibly efficiently. And we have committed to joining the EDF. What that means is that our military will become essentially interdependent on EU member state military. And that is a step away from NATO. It is a step away from independent defense and into their permanent structured cooperation, which is PESCO, their alternative to NATO. Something that came up a bit on the campaign trail and we were told, oh, it's never going to happen, is the concept of an EU army. Where are we at when it comes to the EU and foreign and defense policy? We wanted to keep everything under NATO, the wider, more powerful alliance and didn't think creating a bit of tension between EU control forces and NATO was a particularly good idea. And do bear in mind, it's a one-way process. PESCO stands for Permanent Structured Cooperation. In other words, once we're part of that cooperation, we're there for good. Uh, so we have to be extremely careful of this. And what about the EU? are they doing since we left? Well, we thought it was a great opportunity to ask some of our guests just that. The reason I became so anti-EU was my direct experience of seven years as a minister in the, in, in the John Major government, when I just saw at first hand as a minister how utterly unable we were to take charge of our own destiny. If we wanted a law that was incompatible with Europe, we couldn't have it. If we didn't want a law that they wanted us to have, we had to have it. We were simply not uh, an independent sovereign state. The EU wanted to say there was only one way to make a car or there was only one way to make a washing machine and you had to follow this particular recipe. Whereas I was saying, but there may be a better way. And of course, there should be a general law so that you don't do anything unsafe and a general law that these things must be fit for purpose. But you don't need, as lawmakers, to tell people how to make a washing machine. How, how does a lawmaker know how to make washing machines? And there may be a much better way of making washing machines. There are no officials working for the government now who can remember a time when we were not part of the European Union. And there's a kind of phantom limb sy syndrome going on. Uh, European Union has been amputated and been got rid of, but they just feel as if it's still there somehow. Planning is one of the areas where the EU caused the longest delays through all its habitats directives, its nutrients directives. All of these laws, actually nutrients was an ECJ ruling, I think, but it nonetheless stopped development happening. 
new businesses that are going to be at the cutting edge of developments over the next few decades. Uh, those are businesses that I think will be held back by the sorts of regulations that the European Union likes. The precautionary principle of banning things if you're not sure that what the impact of it is going to be. The key areas where we're hitched at the hip to the EU are state aid, competition, employment and the environment. And these are massive areas of government policy. Which is the slowest growing of all the blocks? The European Union. Which is the, the, the block that no one else is trying to replicate in terms of a trading blocks anywhere else in the world, whether it's in the Americas or whether it's in the much faster growing Asia? No one's trying to replicate the EU because it's a disaster. It's quite incredible how UK entrepreneurs are out there doing so many fantastic things, but the type of pop person who seems to go into Parliament just doesn't want anything to change and they want to keep everything the same as it was in the EU, even though in general the EU isn't something you'd want to emulate. We left this ever-evolving, ever-expanding, anti-democratic monstrosity that loathes democracy and doesn't want the little people to have a say. So in 5, 10, 15 years, I think the EU is going to be a hell of a mess and we've managed to escape it now. For many people, the way that the EU has treated Northern Ireland has been utterly shameful. Here's what some of our guests have to say on that. Northern Ireland is a part of the United Kingdom. Unfortunately, Theresa May uh, was rather taken in by the Irish government and the European Union, who saw immediately, who saw for some time that Northern Ireland was always going to be something that they could kind of beat the rest of the UK with because it was the only part of the United Kingdom that had a border with the European Union. And I think they felt that that meant that they could, uh, you know, control Northern Ireland as well, because that's what the Irish government want, obviously. But more importantly, that it was a kind of thorn in, um, in, in the UK government's side. We should always have said to the European Union, we're not going to put a border uh, in Ireland. You put one in if you like. We should not have tied ourselves in to protecting the single market, that's their business, not ours. The ECJ still has uh, a role uh, in our affairs through Northern Ireland, which we've comprehensively abandoned. Legally, we have to be rid of the Northern Ireland Protocol, and in fact, the Centre for Brexit Policy, of which I'm a chairman, in fact, uh, has put forward a proposal for mutual enforcement, which should be a good legal solution to the difficulty of Northern Ireland. The Windsor framework means that Northern Ireland comes under EU laws and by de facto if we're going to trade with our own nation then uh, we have to come under European laws. And the drawback with Northern Ireland becoming this vassal state is that Great Britain is distinct from Northern Ireland. Is it, it's really difficult for Great Britain to diverge without making it clearer and clearer that Northern Ireland's been left behind. Northern Ireland's still in um, the EU for commercial matters in, in a way, I mean legally, uh, not in the treaties but under EU law, uh, which is going to be a drag factor on the whole of the UK leaving the EU scheme. So that needs sorting out as well. Northern Ireland, a critical component of the United Kingdom, it is the union of Great Britain and Northern Ireland that makes the UK, has been left behind. You know, it is subject to laws made in Brussels adjudicated by a Brussels court and in which they have no right of voice, no vote, nothing. What the Windsor framework did actually was remove grace periods that were being used under the protocol, get rid of those, get rid of the ability for Stormont to ditch the protocol and it had a right in 2024 to ditch it if it wanted to through a vote at Stormont, get rid of all of that and actually put the protocol in stone. Two things can happen. Either we diverge a lot from the European Union and Northern Ireland will be more and more cut away and have to go more and more towards the Republic of Ireland in the EU, or we use it, not we, but the, those who we would like us to have a closer relationship with the EU, use the fact that Northern Ireland has got this closer relationship uh, and use that to get the rest of us, Great Britain, back into EU single market. The way that Brexit has been handled after that historic referendum has been a huge disappointment for so many voters who backed it. We've asked our panel what they think about that.
In order to judge Brexit, we would have had to have got Brexit to start with. And I don't mean to sound pedantic or fastidious, and I'm not being pedantic or fastidious, but the ticket said the United Kingdom leaving the EU. That's what we voted for, and we haven't got that. We're still governed by far too much uh, EU law. We're now still left with practically everything day to day that we do in terms of health and safety, uh, all the issues that used to really annoy people, and you could say, well, that's, you know, that's down to the EU. None of that has really gone yet. And we are subject to the Remain campaign and the sort of Europhiles, particularly in the House of Lords, uh, implying that anything we get rid of means that we're you know, going back to almost Dickens times. It's, it's quite ridiculous. Here we are, seven years later, debating Brexit, when it should have all happened by now. And we can go round in circles to sort of try and understand why it hasn't happened. But the reality is, is it hasn't happened because a small minority of parliamentarians have been trying to dilute Brexit right away from the moment that uh, Britain voted to leave the European Union for 52 to 48. Then Parliament elected a Remainer, Theresa May, to run the process. That ended in disaster with all sorts of issues there. So really, the, the point is, why, why are we having this interview? We shouldn't be having this interview about Brexit. It should have happened by now. And what you're seeing is really democracy not in action. I think parliamentarians need to hang their head in shame. It's a disgrace what's going on in our parliament these days. I detect uh, almost a fear still within particularly the civil service that they're just not used to having to go it alone, make decisions, uh, because they were so used to constantly ringing through to Brussels and working out the line. Now, we could take advantage of Brexit. We could make ourselves very attractive to investment. That was always the fear uh, that uh, the EU had. They thought we would become Singapore on Thames. Uh, and we've said, no, 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 we'll crawl along with you. Well, to my mind, that is a betrayal of what the British people wanted. There are those who have never stopped campaigning to rejoin the EU. Is that a real risk? Well, here's what they have to say. We currently have a right to elect our own government. Why would you vote to give that away? It is all fundamentally democracy. And then after democracy, it is having confidence that we can actually govern ourselves better than we will be governed by a bureaucracy, a remote bureaucracy in Brussels. So we have to try and make people realise that they were right to vote for us to be self-governing. They were right to think that with those powers there were things we could do that would make the lives of billions of people easier. The EU is a relatively low growth area compared with the United States and compared with much of Asia. Uh, the EU is a very over-regulated area which drives good investment and innovatory ideas and companies away from its shores. That is why it's failed to have any of the giants of the, the great digital revolution. And if we just hook ourselves more closely to that or align even more closely to that, we miss most of the opportunities that Brexit brings. But I'd still rather be out of the EU uh, because at least we're not uh, going to be on the hook for all those huge financial liabilities which the EU is now building up at a colossal speed. During the COVID lockdowns, the EU borrowed close on a trillion dollars itself. Now remember, all the borrowing that's been done at, by, at, by the EU historically has been done by the ECB, the European Central Bank, which is responsible for monetary policy. But the EU took on borrowing powers during COVID. If we were to make an application to rejoin the European Union, for example, we'd have to sign up to the single currency which is an inherently weak and unstable currency because it's not backed, backed by sovereign wealth. So th that's one thing that people should, should think very carefully about. In that mad scenario that the rejoiners take control and they go back to the EU and say, we've made a mistake, can we rejoin? What sort of negotiating position do you think that is? It would be laughable. Our Labour going to take us back into membership of the European Union? No. Just not going to happen, certainly not in the next four to five years. They wouldn't even try to do it. 
they'd be mad to take that battle on because of course the cost of rejoining would be huge. What I think will happen is what is happening, which is we don't have to rejoin to keep ourselves aligned to Europe, to keep ourselves uh, within their rules, to keep ourselves non-competitive with them. Uh, we don't have to rejoin to do all that. That is already happening. Uh, and that is what I see as the Remainers route to an eventual rejoining a long way down the line. Our sincerest thanks to everybody who participated in this documentary and those who helped to make it. I really do hope you enjoyed it. Now, the fight for Brexit is still not over. If you want to help us secure a fully sovereign United Kingdom, then if you click on the links below this video and go to cibuk.org or factsforeu.org, you can make a small contribution to help us fight the good fight. Thank you ever so much. Anything you can spare will be gratefully received. What will be the biggest risks to this country? Oh, sorry. No. Um, darling, you can't, you're going to wreck the continuity. Oh, you're a continuity error. Darling, oh, <laughs> sorry, what was the question? And what do we need to do going forward to really utilise the full potential of Brexit? Yeah, I can see that. Sorry. <laughs> Really the sorry. Intruder. The damn fly. Yeah, sorry. You, you can cut that out. I could see you yawning at one point. Yeah, I mean, it is dull. It is dull. You can cut that out. It chimes on the half hour, unusually. Ah. Half time, it's broken. Okay. Cut that out. Perfect. A star. Great. <laughs> <laughs>